Welcome to worship at our Savior's this morning. I am Pastor Heary. Pastor Maria is preaching this morning. Uh, we are, I, I welcome you to our indoor worship. If you were listening uh, last week, we were planning on an outdoor service, and it is not 92 degrees right now. Like the forecast said earlier in the week when we had to make a decision. So uh, we'll enjoy the air-conditioned comfort today. Uh, special welcome to you if you are new to our saviors. We would love to connect with you. We have connection cards that are in the pew pocket in front of you. You could fill one out and turn that in at the reception desk. That would be great. And uh, if you're online, we also have a connection card on our website under Connect. Just a few things to highlight today. We are doing a school supply drive for our school partnership, which is Cedar Creek Elementary. If you want to learn more about that partnership, we have one of our Feels Like Home series articles that just came out last Thursday on email. So if you didn't catch it on email, uh, you can, on the QR code on our happenings, you can read that. Special thanks to Karen Maring for writing these series thus far. They've been a really great way to tell the story of the ministry impact on people's lives from our Savior's. And also, I hate to say it, but fall is coming up, so fall registration for all of our children, youth, and family programs is open. Uh, all ministries are seeking volunteers. Uh, we're seeking them out, but if you would like to step forward, you can either talk to Leisha or Nathan, or uh, you can see the website for ways to connect. I think th those are all the announcements I'm going to highlight, so I invite you to stand as you're able, and we will share God's peace with one another from our places with a smile or a wave. Please remain standing for our opening song. One, two. Thank you. 
for today's sermon series, Pastor Maria is going to preach on a subject that I'm so excited for her um, to clarify for me. As I told you last week, I grew up in a very uh, strict conservative household um, where the fear of the Lord was definitely put into us kids. And uh, I really struggled all growing up with uh, reconciling uh, a loving God of the New Testament of, as of now with the seemingly um, vicious God of the Old Testament. Um, today we're going to sing Reckless Love and, and it's talking about God's reckless love which is not reckless as in um, what we normally think. It's reckless as in we don't understand it. We don't understand why he would leave 99 sheep and go after just one. It doesn't make sense to us, but we are so thankful that he does that. He loves each and every one of us, and he will pursue us to the end of the earth. And it is the same God in the New Old Testament as the New Testament. So let's sing Reckless Love, and I can't wait to hear what Pastor Maria says about it.
God, your love is overwhelming and never ending and so, so generous to us. While we may not understand it, we are definitely grateful for it. Remind us and show us that you are slow to anger and overflowing with love. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, it is time for the children's offering and message, so come on up. We're putting away our toys first. <laughs> Come on up, have a seat. Wow, and they just keep coming and coming. Holy macaroni. All right, oh, thanks for bringing an offering, nice. Actually, I've got a, there's a little piece about offering in my story today that will probably surprise you. All right. Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. Do you think it's possible to be angry and loving at the same time? All right, we got a yes from the back, but that is also a really, really big question, so let me put it a different way. Do your parents love you? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Do your parents sometimes get angry with your behavior? Yes. Yes, okay. So when parents are upset, look, they're like every other kid in the world, right? So when your parents are upset because of something you've done, do you think they still love you? Yes. It is 100% possible for your parents to love you and be angry about something you did, especially if it was something that could get you hurt or could hurt other people. So today I want to talk about Jesus being loving at a time when he was angry. Did you know Jesus got angry? There is a Bible story about Jesus getting angry. Let me tell you what happened. So Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate the holiday of Passover, like a lot of Jewish people did. And back then, this is way back in Bible times, uh, the Jewish people sacrificed animals like doves to God at the temple. Now, since most people traveled a long way, like from towns and towns away to get to the temple, it was hard for them to bring along their own animals to sacrifice. And so there were doves for sale at the temple. And in all the years past, those were sold to people at really fair prices, to tired travelers, just to make things easier for them. But this time, this time the animal sellers were charging really high prices. People were being cheated not cool, right? And not only that, but there was also money being exchanged. This was really kind of, this sounds really super weird to us, right? So the religious leaders back then told people that they couldn't use regular money for their offering. You know how like you guys bring like quarters or a dollar bill? They said, no, no, you can't use the money you already have. You have to buy special temple money. And so they would trade for special temple money and they would overcharge so that they could make money and cheat the people, which is not cool. Let me show you what I mean. I have, so let's say, can you be my volunteer? Let's say you've got $20 and you're coming to the, to the temple. This is first century, so super long ago. And you want to put that in the offering. And I say to you, no, you can't use that. Uh, you have to use our special temple money. Now, this is a euro. My kid actually had money from going to Germany. So this is what they use in Germany. And I said, nope, you can't use that. You have to use this. So you'd think 20 for 20, even trade, right? It's not how it was. Let me sneak you these. No one sees this. Here, here. Okay. So now I'm going to say, yep, you can't just give me a 20 for this 20. I need those other $2 too. Here, now let's trade. Does that seem right? No, it's totally not right. Thank you for being my volunteer. That's not right, that's totally cheating, right? And then I'm pocketing extra money, that's not okay. And you know what? When Jesus got to the temple and he saw this happening, he was angry that people were being cheated. So he turned over the tables of the money changers and he told the people charging way too much for animals, he told them to leave, okay? Now, if Jesus was angry with the money changers for cheating people, does that mean Jesus is angry and not loving? No, nope. 
Jesus was angry because he loved the people who were being cheated and he just wanted the money changers to stop, right? That is called righteous indignation. You're welcome, parents. We're going to say that together. Can you say righteous indignation? Righteous indignation. That's when we get upset that someone is being mistreated, okay? We can speak up for them when that happens. Now, we want to do that calmly. We don't want to be flipping tables over like Jesus did, okay? We are going to do it calmly. And the best way for you to do that is to tell a trusted grown-up what's going on and they can help make the wrong situation right. So, who knew? Jesus got angry, but he got angry because he loved people and wanted them to not be cheated anymore. So let's fold our hands and let's pray and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving the people who were cheated in the temple. Thank you for loving the people who were cheated in the temple. That was a long time ago. That was a long time. It's interesting that anger can sometimes come from love. It's interesting that anger can sometimes come from love. Thank you for helping those people long ago. Thank you for helping those people long ago. Help us speak up when people are mistreated. Help us speak up when people are mistreated. That's one way we can share your love. It's one way we can share your love. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Thanks for coming up. If you are heading out to kids' time, you could head down the center aisle with Leisha. If you're staying in worship, you can head back to your seats. Thanks for coming up. scripture this morning is another story from the Old Testament. This is from 2 Samuel chapter 6. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the Ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio Abinadab's sons were guiding the cart that carried the Ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the Ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the Ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, do you think God is angry? If there is one image that pops to mind when it comes to God and anger, it's being struck by lightning, right? You do something, a bolt of lightning will come from heaven. When some of us think that a bolt of lightning is ridiculous because, after all, in this technological age, God certainly has more modern methods, right? Maybe you remember this far side cartoon of God ready to hit the smite button on the divine keyboard. Do you think God is angry? Is God a smiter? Well, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll probably wrestle with that question. Many times in the Old Testament, God is portrayed as loving and gracious, but turn the page and you come across a God who seems filled with rage. And it's those stories that make some people not want to have anything to do with God. If God can be gentle and loving one moment and seemingly harsh and cruel the next, maybe the best thing to do is to stay away from God? Well, we are in week three of our series, God Behaving Badly. 
And during this series, we're looking at passages from the Old Testament that lead some people to believe that God is harsh, unfair, and cruel. So without minimizing the challenges in these biblical stories, we're trying to make sense of the God we discover there. And today we're asking the question, is the Lord angry or loving? But before we go there, let me just say that there is no way that we'll be able to resolve all of this in the span of one sermon. Okay? Scholars have spent decades wrestling with these texts, and many have disagreed about how to understand them. So our goal today is not to tie everything up in a nice little bow, though that would be great, but instead, our goal is to enter into a dialogue about these texts that we usually ignore or, frankly, might want to run away from. So that said, let's dive into a pretty confusing story, the story of Uzzah and the Ark. Now, when I say Uzzah and the Ark, I don't mean a boat like Noah's Ark. The Ark in today's story was known as the Ark of the Covenant. This Ark was a gold-covered wooden chest that contained the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now, this ark was the place where the Lord would meet with the people during that time in Israel's his history. During the Exodus, the Lord tells the people, I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant, those two angels on the lid. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. So the Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of God. Now, as we fast forward to the time of David, the unthinkable has happened. Because of their disobedience, Israel is defeated by their enemy, the Philistines. 30,000 Israelites are killed in the battle, and the ark falls into enemy hands. But as we turn to our story in 2 Samuel chapter 6, the tide has turned. King David has just defeated the Philistines who agree to return this sacred object to the people of God. A huge mass of soldiers gathers for the occasion. So again, from 2 Samuel chapter 6, now that you have some context. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the Ark of God. It's coming back from the Philistines. They placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the Ark of God. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments. Lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. It is a biblical parade with a marching band of Bible time instruments. You've got 30,000 people cheering and shouting and singing as the ark returns to God's people. The story goes on. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled. Right? They're pulling the cart. The oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. What in the world just happened? Right? What in goodness name? Wasn't Uzzah doing a good thing by keeping the ark from tipping over? I mean, if we had been there, most of us would have been like David, angry at God for what happened. I mean, is the Lord a smiter after all? This story is tough, and I don't want to minimize that, but I do want to spend some time thinking about the question, why does the Lord become angry? Okay. As we look at this story in light of the whole narrative of the entire Old Testament, I think the Lord got angry for a number of reasons. First, if we go back to the time of the Exodus, after the Lord gave the Israelites instructions on how to build the ark, he gave them very clear instructions about how to transport the ark. It was to be carried on poles by the priests. 
the Lord warned the Israelites that if anyone touched the ark, they would die. Right? And out of love, God repeated this command several times in Exodus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in order to keep the people safe. Right? And for all the years leading up to our story, the ark was transported correctly. People knew how to do it, and they realized that God's power present in the ark was inherently dangerous. I mean, throughout the Old Testament, it's seen as pretty miraculous if somebody sees God and lives to tell about it, right? As an analogy from today, think about how we transport radioactive materials, right? Very carefully. <laughs> God is much more powerful than, let's say, plutonium, right? So the people recognized God's power and they knew how to carry the ark. I mean, it was impossible to forget because as you can see, it had two rings on each side with poles that were never to be removed. Every time they looked at it, they would remember, oh yeah, Lord said it's supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priests, obviously, right? Now the timing of this incident plays a role in God's actions. It was Israel's disobedience that led to the capture of the ark and the wartime death of 30,000 people in the first place. Now, another crowd of 30,000 soldiers is watching this procession. So God didn't want to send the message that obedience was optional. Too many lives had already been lost. Still, if disobedience were the only reason the Lord got mad, we'd probably think God was being a little petty and harsh. There's another reason the Lord got angry. Let's try to put ourselves in God's divine shoes for a minute. Okay. In fact, to understand how God might have felt, imagine this. You're going out to brunch with friends after worship. You decide to carpool from the church parking lot. As you and your friends approach your car, you pop open the trunk and tell your friends to get in. Right? It's not that there's no room in the car. You don't have junk all over the back seat. You've just decided that your friends aren't seatbelt material. So you ask them to ride in the trunk. Ridiculous? Of course it is. But it's also disrespectful. No one should have to ride in the trunk. With the way the Israelites were transporting the Ark of the Covenant, they were essentially telling the Lord to get in the trunk. Remember, the Ark represented the very presence of God. The reason the Lord instructed the Ark to be carried on poles by the priest was because that's how royalty was honored in that culture. You've seen that in movies, right? The king sitting on a throne being carried by his servants. It's called a litter, right? It was important for the ark to be treated in a royal way because God is Israel's king. Litters were for royalty. Carts were for things. Placing the ark on a cart like a thing revealed the attitude of the people toward their king. It was disrespectful. It was an insult to the Lord. And take note, God did not strike anybody dead for putting the ark on a cart, right? It was only when Uzzah grabbed hold of the ark, which they had been warned not to touch, <clears throat> and never would have been necessary if they'd been carrying it properly, right? So all of this... <laughs> All of this leads to the core reason I think the Lord got mad. The people were not valuing their relationship with God. Their lack of respect for the ark was a symptom of their lack of concern for their relationship with the Lord. The ark of the covenant symbolized not only the presence of God, but also the covenantal relationship between God and God's people. The Lord valued that covenant so highly that the Lord got angry when the people didn't treat the ark, the symbol of that relationship, with the care it deserved. 
Now, I know these reasons don't answer all of our questions, but they do give us some understanding, a different perspective. We see that the Lord gets angry about a breakdown in relationship. God seems to get mad when there's some action or decision that pushes against the close bond that God wants to have with God's people. When I compare that what makes God mad to what makes me mad, I mean, I get mad when the Wi-Fi goes down for an hour. I get mad when I can't open those little plastic bags in the produce section at the store. Anybody else? Oh, it's the worst. You know? But compared to the things that make me angry, the Lord's reasons are a whole lot more honorable. The Lord gets angry about a breakdown in relationship. And we haven't even talked about the times the Lord gets angry over injustice. I mean, if we had like multiple days, we could look at examples of the Lord getting angry over violence against the innocent, discrimination against entire groups of people, oppression of the poor. I mean, unlike me, the Lord gets angry over the right things. And there's something else about the Lord's anger that's important. Throughout the Old Testament, the Lord is described as being slow to anger. Here are just a few places. Moses, the leader, says, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Jonah, the prophet, says, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from punishment. David the king says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The people in the Old Testament who knew the Lord best all say that the Lord is slow to anger. In fact, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find a repeated pattern with God's anger. It goes like this. God delivers God's people. They complain. The Lord is patient. They promise to obey. The first opportunity they get, they disobey. The Lord eventually becomes angry and punishes them. Finally, the people repent and the Lord delivers them. And the cycle continues. <laughs> it's a lot like parenting, am I right? The Lord's anger is not fickle or unpredictable or spiteful. It's tied to the Lord's love. Do you notice that in all three of those verses, the people who knew the Lord best not only said that God is slow to anger, but is also abounding in steadfast love. Anger and love are not mutually exclusive. It's God's love for people that leads to God's anger over broken relationship. It's God's love for people that leads to God's anger over injustice. It's important for us to remember that when we come across these stories in scripture that are so troubling. And I know these passages about God's anger are tough. It's hard to make sense of them. And sometimes no amount of carefully reflecting will resolve all the issues. But when we encounter a story that's troubling, we need to ask, why did the Lord get angry? Look for a reason connected to relationship. Look for a reason having to do with injustice. Remember to view the story in the context of the entire Old Testament. God is both quick to love and slow to become angry. The Lord is not a smiter. Before we wrap up, let's make this kind of personal. How can God's anger be a model for us? I mean, first of all, some of us, myself included, need to be challenged about getting angry over stuff we don't need to get angry about. Right? Not just little things like the plastic bags in the produce section, but deeper things too, like truly being inconvenienced or having our pride wounded. Second, 
Others of us, myself included in this one too, need to be challenged to get angry over the stuff God gets angry about. As I told the kids, I like to think of it as righteous indignation. God gets angry about a breakdown in relationship, and God gets angry about injustice. The people who end up making the biggest difference in this world are usually the people who get mad about the right things. From Mother Teresa to Martin Luther King Jr. to everyday people fighting racism, sexism, homelessness, human trafficking, and everything else that goes against what God dreams for our world. Let's be people who get angry about injustice and do something about it because we follow a God who loves people and gets angry about those things. So, does God get angry? Yes. Is God loving? Yes. Anger and love are not mutually exclusive, as any parent will tell you. The passages in the Old Testament about the Lord's anger are troubling. But if we look beyond the surface, we find a God who is full of love and slow to anger. We don't have to be afraid of the Lord. God is not out to smite us. On the contrary, the Lord welcomes us with open arms. If you ever doubt the love of God, just look to the cross. There you'll find a love that absorbed every angry blow as Jesus was nailed to a cross because of how much he loves you and me. For God, the Lord, so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Amen.
Please join me in prayer as we pray for God's mercy where it meets us in our world in need. Let's pray. Lord, we might always struggle with stories of your anger. When we come across them in the Bible, remind us to ask why you got angry and explore how long it took you to get angry. Stir us to righteous indignation in the face of injustice and broken relationships that we might be a force for justice in the world. Lord God, you care for all that you have created. We ask that you would walk with those affected by the fires on Maui. Comfort those who mourn and bring relief to survivors. Be with communities facing danger today, especially we pray for those facing the storms in Mexico and California. Heal your people and your land. God, you call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. Inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way. Support fair, a fair world. Provide care for military personnel and veterans. And show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. God, you provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism or prejudice and shield any who are persecuted. Console the dying and heal those who are sick. Today especially we pray for Pat Nelson, Kay Hunter, Cindy Nelson, Brad, Zach Spaniel, David Kappelhoff, Skip Bremer, Riley, Seal Aker, Kathy and Lloyd Whitaker, Pauline Nielsen, Jim Zeke, Jovita Romero, Michelle Brown, Brittany Danielson, Audrey Lundstrom, Sherry, Lynn Gleason, Norm Leslie, and Randy, Randy Hill Jr. We lift these prayers to you, O oh God. Please hear us and hear the prayers that we've laid before you from our hearts. You are the one who reconciles all creation to yourself. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we have something kind of neat. Uh, earlier this month was Vacation Bible School, and we had over 80 kids registered uh, that attended, and then nearly 30 uh, teenagers and adults who were part, uh, who were helpers for that. So we have a video to show you the highlights from VBS. Let's watch. We're in search of new horizons We are going where we've never been When the call comes we will answer We will follow where Jesus leads and know oh, oh, oh. Together we will learn to serve and we will go, go, go Together we will change the world Hero Hotline This is not a test Some of you out there today saw yourselves in that video, didn't you? Uh, one of the cool things I heard about was that um, those teenagers that you saw, they, many of them stepped up to the plate and they were great leaders and some of the kids who were more nervous to come or to stay, they entered into those relationships and became one of the really cool parts of our Vacation Bible School this year. So thank you to our, especially to our teen helpers and parents who made sure that they were able to get here as well. Well, uh, your offering supports Vacation Bible School and all our children, youth, and family ministries, and for that we are grateful. Now is when we consider our offering, and so I'll just remind you of the various ways we can give. If you're here in person, you can place your offering in the baskets by the doors as you leave today. You can also always mail in a check, give through the Vanco app, or you can give through our website, OurSaviorsLC.org. Let's pray as we give thanks to God for the gifts that are shared. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Give us glad and generous hearts that your love would bring about the healing of the world through us. Gratefully, we pray.
Amen. Well, it is time to prepare for communion. Um, the most important thing about communion at Our Saviors is to know that all are welcome to receive communion and these gifts of love and grace and mercy that Jesus gives us through it, this meal. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, just a few notes as we, uh, before we come forward for communion. If you're coming forward, when the servers are ready at the front of your section, they'll give you a nod. You can then just come forward row by row from the front to the back. Center sections, you'll come up the middle aisle and go back by those side aisles. Outside sections, you'll come up along the wall and go back by those same aisles. Um, when you reach your communion station, simply hold out your hands. We'll drop a wafer into your hands. You can then take that and dip it into the chalice. The larger part is red, that is wine. The smaller part is grape juice, that is white. You may then eat it together and return to your seats. Uh, if you have someone with you who doesn't take communion, please have them come forward for a blessing. And if you need gluten-free wafers, those are available on the stands at the front of each section. More details are on the front of your happenings. So for those who are communing in place or at home, hear these words as you receive the meal. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite the communion servers forward at this time.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Generous God, thank you for feeding us at your holy table. Send us now, strengthened by this meal, to speak out with courage, break down divisions, build bridges of understanding, and serve others in your name. Amen. And receive the blessing. The God who created the cosmos, the God who is with you always, bless you and sustain you, giving you courage and peace. Amen. One, two, three, four.
serve the Lord. We will. Yes. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Two, three.